He is fucking bat shit crazy, Gene. But he's not good he's bat shit. He's a dickhead. He's delusional. He still thinks they invented everything. My brother's 48. Like, yeah. God. To, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, now he mocks them. You know what I mean? Right. Because of what they become. It's, it's a parody. You know what I mean? At this point. 60-year-old men, you know? And fucking the, the, uh, the ramblings of fucking Paul Stanley on stage are like... The only, the only better stage rambler is fucking uh, Kronos from Venom. <laughs> like, he, he's batch insane. Bro, there's some shit like, you remember the Beasties sample? Wild man, wild. All right, get off the bus. You wild man, wild. That's insane. Dude. That was from, that's him. That's it. Yeah, but like just this bad like over the top fucking like viking but, like bad metalhead in between like we come here from the nether regions to torture your soul but for like fucking 20 <laughs> minutes in between 20 minute songs sweet that fuck you man we gotta get out here and do some gigs you wild man wild so, uh, so we're gonna do a track for you now. You know, you heard some rumors out here that uh, Venom have packed in, yes? Venom is supposed to have finished. Well, we're recording a fucking new album now! It's a bit Amazing! I saw, I saw you. You saw fucking uh, Slayer. Yes. in eighty eighty six, something the like that. The Rain and Blood tour. Yeah, yeah. What I was, was that? Uh, where? How, how was that? Oh, it was in people. There's a, a club in Philly called the Trocadero. Yeah. Um, there's a balcony. People were jumping off of the balcony. I've never seen it or heard of it in any scene. Punk, metal, hardcore, craziest shows. I don't care. Whatever lore there is out there of crazy shows, yeah. when they did the uh, what's uh, what was the place in New York, the Felt oh, Forum? Yeah, I remember. I remember everyone ripped the seats out at that Slayer show and tore the seats apart. The famous Slayer show at New York City's Felt Forum took place on August thirty first, nineteen eighty eight. Former Roadrunner and Warner A and R rep Howie Abrams was there, and he remembered it this way. There was a sense of violence in the air from the minute I arrived at the show, says Abrams. It seemed as if half the crowd was on angel dust and just didn't give a fuck about their own safety, much less anyone else's. To this day, I don't recall seeing as many bloodied, passed out, and fucked up kids in one building as I saw at this infamous show. According to the New York Times Review, fans started tearing out cushions from seats and throwing them around towards the end of the night to cause several thousand dollars worth of damage. But there were people, DRI opened up, and uh, people were jumping off of the balcony and I'm I'm like 10 years old. Yeah. Like what the fuck is going on? Like here? not even caring if they land anywhere. Yeah, not like just <laughs> fucking reckless <laughs> abandon, man. And like I don't know how I would react to that now at my age, but when you're a fucking kid, man, like yeah. First off, Sing Slayer and he's fucking Arias screaming hell Satan. You know what I mean? I don't know. How, I don't. I don't even think I should have been there. It's probably why I'm the way I am. Yeah, and that was. I mean, that was the original band. Sadly, they're not. No, they'll never. No, be there. never will be because yeah, if Hanneman passed was devastating, and they can't get it together with Lombardo. I think Perry King is just a difficult guy, from what I can gather. I don't know him personally, yeah. but I know Tom Mariah is. Uh, we were supposed to work together actually at one point, and. He's like a sweetheart of a guy, you know, so I can't see him being a problem there. You know what I mean? Lombardo's the best metal drummer ever to me. I was going to ask about that because you, you have that one lyric where, uh, where you shout out uh, Vinny. Vinny Apathy. Apathy, yeah. Well, yeah. I am Ibrahim's last prophecy. Earth is my property. I am possessed like I'm an apostrophe. Vinny Apathy is like a star to me. Pass where solemnly. Cut your fucking head like a lobotomy. Break the fucking beat like sodomy. Nietzsche in philosophy. There's Vinny and Carmine. Vinny says apathy and Carmine says a piece. And they're brothers. And they argue how to say their last name. Yeah, but the Apathy brothers, yeah, great drummers, yeah. Yeah, who are some of your other favorite metal 
Drummers. Um, wow. Uh, I love Mitch Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it's metal particularly. Uh, wow. Well, drummers generally. You know, yeah. So um, I was thinking about. You it know who's a lyrics. lunatic, and I can't think of his name. He left Mars Volta. Mm-hmm. That guy's fucking a lo- a maniac. Yeah. He had a side project with Zach De La Roca. They did two songs that were dope as fuck. And I never heard another peep. It was just those two. I think it was called like Power of the Lion. The drummer's name is John Theodore, and the group was called One Day as a Lion. Wow. Something like that. It was dope. That guy's amazing. Um, Have you ever thought about singing in like a hardcore band? I did. Well, you did that a little bit as a kid. Yeah. Uh, I had like a couple bands with kids I grew up with in Philly. Yeah, like. Um, like hardcore and punk stuff, you know what I mean? Um, are you familiar with Terror, the hardcore band? I don't, I don't know. That I, we did a, uh, they did a cover of a, um, a breakdown song on one of the seven inches, and I sung on it. I play my brother my brother was in bands and our parents let them practice at our house so obviously the first thing I did when they told me never to go near the instruments was to go this down to the instruments. instruments so yeah I picked up the drums you know not you know good but I can play a little bit of drums and bass and t- terribly guitar but I just like cuz I would just mess around you know what I mean? Yeah does any of that make it onto records even in like demo I did an in, the intro uh, for a mixtape I did. I like played the bass line and programmed everything. Let's play that game. <laughs> How do you stop me? How do you stop something like this? How do you stop something that wins wars without lifting a finger? How do you stop something that's been worshipped by every soul since the dawn of ages? How do you stop something that can never be destroyed? But nothing yet. I'm not a uh, big fan. <laughs> no, I think yeah. uh, the prerequisite of becoming a rapper is to be delusional. Right. I, I luckily I I think I'm pretty. You're okay. Yeah, I think I'm alright. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, so the new record, right? Something. It's you know it's funny. I got it right around the time that I got it, uh, completely independently of the record. Although maybe it was kind of in the back of my mind somewhere. Uh-huh. I ended up uh, rewatching Hellraiser and Nightbreed. Oh wow, yeah. dope, dope, dope! Yeah. The new Nightbreed version? Uh, no, the one, the one from when we were kids. Okay, but he, yeah. you, you know, there's a new version of that. No. Yeah, with like an extra half hour. Oh wow. Yeah, Clive like oversaw it. Oh, of that it. film. Yeah. Okay, no, I, th- I think yeah, I just saw whatever was on uh, Netflix. Yeah, you got to check it out. Okay. Yeah, it's dope. Wow. So what? So there's a lot of Clive Barker kind yeah. of themes, like particularly on the last song where you actually, you know, it's named after some yeah, of the Lamar's concepts and the stories. And yeah. The book and the blood of Jerusalem Street and the midnight meat train moving the heat. Raw hair, red hat, coot in his teeth. Every single one of y'all fool for the beast of the human remains in the room for the pain and his rooms of the game when you're new to the game and it's blue in the vein and you shoot it again and the sins of the father to the loose of his reign. But his themes kind of like go through the, sure. the whole record. Yeah. Um. I guess I guess when you're a kid and bad shit happens, you just try to escape it somehow. People like us pick music and then, you know, reading a lot. Like my pop died. I was 10. Like, I guess I was into Clive and Hellraiser by like 11. Then I started reading everything. You know what I mean? Like got me through some stuff and uh, got to meet him at a signing and shit in Philly and like, you know, tell him like, thank you. You know, it's always cool to thank anyone that got you through a rough time. So, uh, when Stoop was giving me the beats for the record, 
I don't know why it just started reminding me. I, I uh, there's I don't know if it's if you would call it a disease. There's a condition when you hear music, you'll you like hear colors. Mm -hmm. The word synthesis Syn might be synthesia or something. Synesthesia. Synesthesia. I have that. So when he gives me things, I see colors, and then when I see colors, colors remind me of other things. Like the reason the the cover of the album is the way it is because the whole time I kept feeling blue, feeling the color. And I don't know how to articulate that. Other, you know, remember in Mask when he's trying to teach the girl, the blind girl, Laura Dern, how things look, but he's trying to do it through touch because yeah. she can't see. It's sort of the same concept. Like I couldn't articulate things with words. When Jan was talking to the artist who was doing it, I was like, I don't know much, but I sing blue. And this is the title, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I'm sorry with, with the Clive thing. Oh, so as just, he was, yeah. as he was giving me the beats, I was sort of like seeing colors, and then some of the colors started reminding me of Clive stuff, you know. So I I didn't want to, I didn't want to old day and be like too overt, where it's like I'm rapping about how right. It's a concept head. record about yeah, Midian or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the gates of Midian. Everything's true. God's an astronaut. Oz is over the rainbow. The medium is where the monsters live. You know, it's, uh, I mean, as brilliant as all that, I just, I just kind of like snuck it in there, mm -hmm. you know, organically. And like heads that are into Clive will get it. And heads that aren't into Clive, it isn't so there in your face that it would alienate them. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. that's tricky to do, you know? I didn't want to alienate any people by being like, or we'll fucking rap about Clive Barker for sixty minutes, like <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You're already you're already dealing with niche audiences, you know what I mean? When you're when you make the type of music we do, you know what I mean? Or your punk rock, or your you're not dealing with, you know, the twenty two million people that listen to Taylor Swift, so you can't alienate the already alienated. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're already dealing with yeah. this, you know, this niche that's, you know, you. So I did, you know. I always try not to. I alienate uh, people in so many other ways, <laughs> right? So maybe not do it with. Ma maybe yeah. not do it with that. But but you did make an elaborate concept album, actually, your first full length album. Yeah, isn't that the fucking dumbest thing you've <laughs> ever heard? I'm gonna come out. The first thing people are gonna hear about me is gonna be a batshit PCP influenced conspiracy theory. Yeah. So when you gonna stand when the Elohim return? Seven great sages throughout the ages say you burn. It's my turn to shine. I redefine the crystalline biological structures implanted in your mind. So I find the deaf, dumb, and blind. It may be the dumbest idea in the history of music. <laughs> It's a great record. I mean, the title, I, I can't even remember the full title. Psycho Psychosocial, chemical, biological, and electromagnetic manipulation of human consciousness. There you go. There you go. Uh, Who? Why was it? <laughs> what was I thinking? There was no, if, if, you don't, if you don't believe in like the punk rock ethic, the, 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 then that should prove it, that, that we weren't trying to become darlings, you know, in any way. It was like, let's think, let me take something from the Bhagavad Gita make that the cover, have uh, an unpronounceable title, and then this whole record will be talking about things that 98% of the population either A, don't know about, or B, believe, or C, care about. You know right. I mean? So I was going to ask kind of where your, your head was at making that record, because there's all this stuff going on, right? You have like these scientific ideas, sure. these historical ideas, biblical, sure. mythological stuff from literature. I don't quite know how to say that it's not like you draw strong divisions between those categories on the record. Right. It's all kind of part of this worldview, right? You're sure. not like this bit's from the Bible and this bit's sure. from history and this is about, you know, UFO, and I was just kind of curious about your mind state while you were while you were writing that. I think it was as all over the place as how you just said it. I I think I, rather than say I have the answers to anything, it's like, well, let me just let me just show you everything, and then you take what 
you take from it. You know what I mean? The same way, like, I remember um, someone once said, uh, it was Artie Lang, the comedian Artie Lang was like, the one thing about The Simpsons and Seinfeld is morons like it and smart people like it, and for two totally different fucking reasons. And when you can find that sweet spot, you become fucking Larry David and, and Jerry, you know what I mean? And it's like, I was never able to do that. You right. know what I mean? It's, it was so alienating of a record, you know what I mean? But I, as far as my headspace, it was just, I was taking in so much information, and I was so young that I didn't know how to funnel it properly how I would today, you know what I mean? Like, if I, if I had all that shit in my head today, that record wouldn't come out that way. It would be l- less abrupt and, like, jarring, you know? It, it definitely was like, you know, th- there, there is an art in making a record that, that is, is divisive, you know what I mean? Like, most of my favorite music is super divisive music that people are either offended by or find it mortifying or just can't get it you know what i mean so i'm proud to have one of those records in my catalog yeah but if you think back upon it like from a business standpoint first off it was vinyl only morons no cds or cassettes idiots and this was in 1997 so it's not like cds were unheard of correct it's not 1982 you know even that might have been stupid because there was you could not do you could not look at the product from the produ- from the start of production of a record to the final product and do it more wrong than that record was done, and it's mind boggling. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I guess another thing about that record is you have some stuff about Jesus, right? But it's about him uh, being created by aliens. Sure. The basis is an extraterrestrial created Christ and have a device that recorded all of Earth's history and can display it in the form of a hologram precise. Construction of synthetic humanoids is among us. You are banned to the land of Nod to face the deafening thunders and the spiritual wonders. About him studying in Tibet, things like that. Sure. Study with Chinese masters like Jesus in Tibet. Staff of Moses, urn of ashes. Morphing my soul into silence, liquids and gases. And it got me thinking, like, I don't, you know, I know that your family is, is, Roman Catholic. Sure, and man. I'm you an Italian are, kid from Philly. Right. And you're, you know, at some at some point uh became and I believe still are Islamic. And where in where in your journey kind of were you during the making that of that record? I think just the stuff about Jesus and how it was, you know, unorthodox got me wondering that. I was just like like a I I think you're still you're trying to find yourself at that age. And you think you have all the answers. And it's not until you're our age now that you realize you didn't know shit then. You know what I mean? And all the shit that, whether it was your your parents or your, the smart uncle that you liked, it was like, you don't know shit. Trust me, you're going to look back and realize you didn't know shit and you just don't listen. It's not, it's why people make mistakes and you just have to allow them to make those mistakes. It's like the same thing with Islam. And like, I found Islam, it helped me at a rough time. But as I get older, I'm definitely embracing the idea of an energy and and that over religion the concept of religion i think and we all can agree that it's caused every war that's ever happened you know whatever, whatever religion you know what i mean we're going back to the crusades and how much do i want to associate myself with any specific i don't want to say organization or religion just anything that because all holy books can be distorted for your own. You see, politi- you see po- politicians distorting the Bible for, you know, like in terms of gay marriage and stuff like that. It's like, I just don't understand why they're manipulating it for, to fit their narrative and not allowing people to just live their lives. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I think that's sad. You know what I'm saying? And like, and, and when you start saying like, all right, the Quran is a beautiful book. Islam got me through a rough time, but what happens if you start saying, well, do I believe everything word for word here? Well, what about the fact uh, that that every of the uh, Abrahamic religions condemn homosexuality? So am I now, do I become a homophobe? You know what I'm saying? Like if I've, if I've said, 
Well, you had uh, you had some uh, you know a lot of language on a lot of your records that yeah. might lead people to think that. Yeah, well, into, uh, that vanished. This record, uh, actually, I was going to ask you about that maybe down the line. Like that stuff just completely. I'll tell you what. The, what what comes around from being in South Philly and you're arguing with someone and you call them a faggot, you you grow up and realize that may, this goes further than your block, and your boys on your block know that you're not calling them a homosexual. You know what I'm saying? I'm, again, I'm, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying how it was. Or, right. or, you know what I mean? But it's then like at you, a certain point, you realize your voice goes wider than yes, your and, and I think that's, you have to start taking responsibility for shit. And like, I have a two-year-old son now, and like, there's a couple things I've said in the past that I would have changed. You know what I mean? Because I don't, like, my mom's television habits basically consist of any show with a midget or any show with gay people. My mom is like, <laughs> the, my, my mom is so fucking, so fucking liberal and like loving of everyone. And she's like obsessed with the gay community. You know what I mean? Like, and even through her, like, she'd be like, you don't, that's not how you are. You know what I mean? But like you said, you the scope of it, like, does a kid in Scandinavia get that? Does he know that? Like, I don't know that it's just some some shit on the block. Stop being a faggot. Like, you know what I mean? Now, hearing myself say it now, it's like, oh, wow, man. Like, I didn't want anyone to think of it like that. Or like, you yeah. know what I mean? If a yeah. kid like isn't super macho at school, that my lyric like made him push a kid at school or something. If that was the reality, I think I, I don't know that I could live with that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, there's other shit that I say that people don't like that as I get over, I will continue to defend. Like, I don't like police. Mm -hmm. I don't like that they can kill unarmed black men and and walk. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Will I step away from that? No. Is it a, Was it a conscious effort to try to realize that there's people that have my face tattooed on them and shit, and if they would go that far, that maybe what taking something literally that I didn't think anyone would take literally, I got to start thinking about that. Could I play that? You know, I don't, when I say, can I play this in front of my son? I don't mean the curse words. I, I'm weird about that, man. I, don't, I curse like a sailor and that's just how it is. I don't believe that, that I believe that the raising and loving, lo, raising a child lovingly and they know you love them and you hug them and kiss them and tell them you love them all the time is good parenting. If I say, if I stub my toe or bang my ankle and yell fuck my my child's gonna be just fine yeah you know what i mean so i don't mean like can i play it in front of my kid in terms of cursing but the idea is do i even want the concept like oh is 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 he anti it's like oh are you anti-christian like no but i do get where you could see it because of the shit that i said but i was saying it that crazily because sometimes motherfuckers won't listen so you find yourself going, you know, it's like, all right, I don't, I don't want to hold back. And then you find yourself going too far one way to try to prove a point. You know what I'm saying? Or like, yeah. And well, also religion wise, I think, you know, around like, when was it? Oh, four, you know, some of the stuff you were doing was, you know, you did that, that Scars of the Crucifix song, which maybe is something you're, you're talking about in terms of the language against Christianity. Absolutely. But at the same time, that song also was defending Islam in a very vehement way. They want to lie to you. They want to tell you that the government's reliable. They want to tell you that Islam is dangerous when everybody know the Christians are to blame for this. Because it's the truth. Deal with it. But you complain every time I'm real with it. I'm about to kill critics and then take them to war and teach them how to put their love and their faith in the law or I'm breaking their jaw. Which even three years after 9-11 was not exactly like a popular no, stance. I mean, trust <laughs> me, these guys weren't really happy with what you know, I was saying at that time. I think, you know what it is, man? I'm like too reactionary. I constantly, like, everyone feels the need to defend themselves when they're pushed into a corner that's 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 nature, you know what I'm saying? From from an, it's just animalistic instinct. But everyone has a different way that they defend themselves. And for years, my way was like, I'm gonna go so fucking far that everyone's gonna be up in arms. And it 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 worked and can work, but you have to live with that for the rest of your life. 
you know what I mean, with that decision. And, you know, it's like, that's not always easy to deal with when you go back and think about shit that you've said over a 20 year career. You know what I mean? It's starting when you were, when was it the first record you were? I w- the, the Amber probe 96. was 96. So I was like 19 recording psychosocial. Yeah. The first professionally done pro- project we did. The soul, Jedi mind tricks was called soul craft. It was named after the bad brain song. Mm-hmm. It was the same group. It was just a different name. We were that since 92 so we're like 23 years together you know what i mean like i mean but then do you beat yourself up over it because you look you guys were lucky enough to just have the brilliant john lydon it's like i don't know if the way he approached it in 77 that he he's going to in 2015 he's still bad shit and he's still the man you know what i mean i don't know if he looks at some of that stuff as trite Mm -hmm. you know what i mean and like he I'm still that kid when I was 19, the way John is still that kid, you know, but there's just different ways to to do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, well, I guess there's 20 different ways to discipline your child. You know what I mean? I don't know the right one, but I know that beating them isn't, you know what I mean? That to reinforce that, you know what I mean? Like, or maybe like a pat on the butt or like a, you know, a little slap on the hand to say, no, don't burn yourself you know what i mean but like i mean there's kids that grew up with us or my brothers he's got fucked up you know what i mean he's got ass whippings i mean coming from an italian home you know i got the wooden spoon to the head you know what i mean but i, I mean i could never lay a child you know what i mean it's it's like so i'm talking you know i sort of talk no no do, do you think that like how old is your is your son now he's two it's two do you yeah. think that like having a son has made you think more about this not you know about your legacy and about ideas you put out into the world. I think it and- all culminate. I think shit came together all at the same time. I had like Jan, who's been like my best friend and business partner since we were in 10th grade. And then some of Stoop's feelings on like, yo man, sometimes I get what you're trying to do. I do. But sometimes you go over the top and not everyone gets it. And like my son coming along, it was like all of this came at once, you know, the alcoholic thing, the moment of clarity, mm-hmm. it was, you know, it wasn't alcohol. It was, yo, are, are, are you, uh, we know what you're trying to do and you're trying to help people, but there's other ways to say it. You could be less abrupt. You could be, you know what I mean? With, without changing shit up too. That's important. Right. I think in the most important ways, this record is pretty, is, you know, has, it's still you. It's still uncompromising in the ways that, like... Right. In the good ways. Yeah. Yeah. You can be uncompromising and not be an asshole. Right. I didn't think you could before. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. I didn't know that you could make uncompromising art and not be a dickhead. Right. Because historically, brilliant minds are assholes or difficult to deal with. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm one of them, but I just, looking at people that were heroes to me. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. you watch Bukowski, like, drunk, drunkenly kicking his wife in, in that movie on the couch. He's like... No. No. Oh, shit! You fucking cunt! Oh. You think you walk out on me every fucking night? You fucking whore. You bitch. Who do you think you, I am? Just... I'm going to do this, live with other people. I do fucking shit. Wow, it's strange to say this guy's one of my heroes. He still is. I, you know, I never touched a girl in my life. I, I laughed. I shouldn't have, but I thought it was a funny part of the movie. But it's like, we look, it's like, it's strange to have heroes who are all so flawed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. all of my heroes are, like, severely flawed. Like, mental cases. You know what I mean? For, whether it's, you know, Bukowski or Miles Davis or Coltrane, you know, whether they had drug or alcohol problems or heroin addicts or, you know, I, there has to be something wrong with you, I think, to be creative, mm-hmm. to be good and creative. If I meet someone and they're too normal, I know their shit is not going to be good before I hear it. I know how judgmental that sounds, but I'm always right. If I meet this, like, normal, good-natured, you know, good nature is great, but... If you're not a little bit off or I don't see a little bit of bat shit gleam in your eye, mm-hmm. I'm like, eh. Or you're just not going to have the 
the the mental acumen to deal with this shit that comes with it. Mm -hmm. Can can you wrap your head around, you know, a kid in Norway saying your song saved his life? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That might, I mean, yeah. I mean, you've had you've had a lot of really, you know, it, it took a, a while, but you've been, you know, you've had a lot of really personal stuff. On your records, I it feel did like take it really. Me a while. It wasn't until like '06, I think. Wh what's the song? Uh, Serenity and Murder, that you really started talking about, you know, some of the stuff going on with you mentally. I think I was like really embarrassed. Um, I, I didn't when I when I started dealing with depersonalization disorder, I didn't even know what it was. So I spent years of my life. This is gonna sound crazy to you. I, it might choke me up by talking about it. But I spent years of my life thinking that I was dead and stuck in purgatory because I had I smoked a blunt of dust before my ninth grade exams and felt like I was floating above my body watching it. You know, when you see those cheesy shows mm -hmm. and people talk about the near death experience in their, their body, yeah. that's how I live my life. That's what depersonalization disorder is. But it, it wasn't, it can't be treated. There's no cure. They can just treat the symptom. So I spent years of my life think, questioning, am I in, in a purgatory? Am I dead? Like heavy shit, man. Like would close my eyes and feel, uh, when I would lay in my bed, it would feel like it kept going. Like I was falling into the abyss. And I was 14 and 15 and 16 dealing with this. So by the time it came around to making music, I was like, I'm not talking about this shit. Man. You know what I mean? Even saying it now, it's never like spoke about it other than the song I made about it, but I never spoke to anyone about that because it's not cancer, it's not autism, it's not this thing that people are so aware of, you know what I mean? And so few people know about it. And there's like two books about it. And when you read those books, the people's stories are people being like, I didn't know how to tell someone that I felt like I wasn't there, that I was living outside of my body, that I was felt like, is this what purgatory is? You know what I mean? Like purgatory that we were raised to think, you right. know, that when, someplace inside heaven and hell. When did you get a name for it? When did you attach a name to it? Um, l late 2008, 9, 10, maybe around then. Wow. Yeah, like uh, when I would describe it to someone, to someone or a doctor or something, it was like um, no one could tell me what was happening so i was getting like a lot of like sorry kid like here's pills that aren't for that but i guess you should be taking something you know what i mean so it's like misdiagnosis then placed on medication that was not designed to treat this so what is it doing to me physiologically or to, you know what i mean and yeah. how did that affect me and still to this day you know what i mean so it's like um i just kept trying to uh google words catch words uh you know the realization or you know what i mean words words that i could think to describe it hoping that that would lead me to something you know what i mean and then i found the word and when i found the word i never i still live with it daily but i can tell you the craziest day in a good way was the day i heard like 10 people describe exactly what I've been going through since 1992. It was like a weight lifted off my shoulders. It didn't fix the disease, but it was, holy shit, other people deal with this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because it's what starts happening is when you, when you have it, you only feel comfortable in your environment. And the irony of my life and the irony of the be careful what you wish for shit is I'm rapping in front of a mirror at nine years old, wanting to be cool C and steady B and wish that I can have a career in music and tour the world. Now, the thing that scares me the most is leaving 
my comfortable environment, which is my home and which is Philadelphia. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because there was, I read an interview with you, I think it was early last year even, uh -huh. and you said that like you hadn't toured because it had been difficult for you for like even the past eight months or so, it's, the prior eight months to to leave your area. It's, it's I'm, I'm going through a, a lot of, I'm struggling right now. You know what I mean? And it's like, what is the alternative? This is all I know. I don't have a degree. You know, I don't, uh, I can't fix a car, you know? And the album tour cycle is still the, the dominant mode. Correct. Yeah. I mean, your job is to inter interview artists. You know better than anyone. I'm sure they've all told you that. Like, yeah. where are record sales? They're gone. Nobody buys wax. Nobody goes to the store on Tuesday like when we were kids. Like, oh, every Tuesday, let's go. What's coming out? You know, go to the punk section, the metal section, hardcore, hip hop. That's dead. The, the opening it up, remember you smell it, the, the way the paper tasted yeah, yeah. and shit. Like, it was a whole experience for me. Yo, who produced that? Who did they thank? Oh, they know that band? Oh, this band thanked that band? They don't, it's like, I'll be painstakingly this artwork. Jan, make sure it says this and tell the guy to do this. And I, then we, we go, does anyone care anymore? Does a 16 year old care? He's probably going to steal my shit anyway right. and not even know that that's wrong. You know what I mean? Has that kid ever been in it? I'm getting to the point now where I look at our crowds and I'm like, I wonder if any of these kids have been in a record store. I have a niece in her mid twenties, a nephew in his early twenties, and my youngest nephew is 19. None of the three of them have been in a record. Even been? No. At, wow. No. And my brother is a lifelong collector. Like that's how I got, I mean, vinyl opening it with a razor blade so that the the plastic still stays on, putting it on cassette and then back in and then never, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, this is where I learned all this shit, learned behavior, you know, my parents listening to Stevie and Smokey Robinson and stuff like that, just having music around, you know what I mean? Hearing Sabbath at six years old, like, yo, the first Sabbath record at six years old at night, like, fuck out of here. <laughs> what are you fucking doing as a brother? You know, they're 11 and 12 years older than me, so they're 17 and 18, right. like drinking and smoking weed and think it's a good idea to throw on the first Sabbath record. Oh my God. Fucking Diabolus and Musica, the fucking notes of the devil. I don't think I slept for like five years <laughs> between that and then they're babysitting me and I'm watching fucking Evil Dead and Suspiria and Italian Gore. You know, you wonder, yeah, right. you wonder how I've turned out, out this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're obviously a huge movie buff. Yeah, yeah. You know, and in fact, the, the song on the new record you have with R.A. is named after a pretty obscure yeah. spaghetti western. Yes, sir. Does that play into your rapping at all? Like the the thinking about movies, thinking about, you know, storytelling and film, how film works? Like, does that... The, the way the people's songs. minds work, dude, like uh, Jordanowski's Dune. Did you see mm -hmm. that? No, no. Oh, my God. Got to check that, man. Yeah. Like, but watching how his mind, or watching Kubrick talk, or watching Stanley Kubrick's boxes and seeing his process and how batshit crazy he was, I'm intrigued by people's process. Yeah, we had uh, we had uh, Lisa Leone on the show. Oh, really? And she was she was uh, I forget the exact title, but basically Kubrick's right hand through yeah. the making of Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's in uh, Stanley Kubrick's boxes, talking about just how bad shit Stanley was. The scene where Tom Cruise walks in uh, with Sidney Pollock and he's shooting pool. All he did was walk in and say hello when they're shooting pool. And Kubrick shot that scene for three weeks. And he'd say cut. So they would cut and Tom Cruise would be confused. Stanley, I'm just walking in. I don't believe you. <laughs> What's there to believe? The way you're walking in this room, I don't believe you. 
and then this dialogue of I'm just walking in a room. There's nothing to believe about that. Yes, there is. That's not how this person would walk into this room. Crazy. And the and the Sidney Pollock part was originally played by Kaitel. And after three days, get the fuck, like they almost fist fought. Wow. He's batch. Right? So that. That level of attention yeah, to detail is. Yeah, I don't know that like, did the shining, did the killing, did that affect my writing from a storytelling point of view? But maybe watching someone's process is is really dope to me, you know what I mean? And how crazy they are. Yeah. And the attention to detail and why they are that brilliant and why he's probably the greatest of all time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean you were you were talking about scary music a minute ago with yeah. you know hearing Sabbath yeah. when you were young and impressionable. Yeah. Another person uh a lot of people thought was scary and who you actually shout out on the new record on Hell's Messenger is, is Schooly D. Were you in Philly when, when his first stuff Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. what were your impressions of, of his music and of him when he first came out? I feel like, you know, people might say, oh, he's the first gangster rapper, I, but no one really knows what that means. Right. In that, like, no one heard that kind of stuff before. I, I believe that what you just said is true. I believe, or that he laid the foundation for what would be gangster rap. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't think there's an NWA without, you know... Looking at my Gucci, it's about that time. Looking at my Gucci, it's about that time. The end of school and to start humming the rhyme. I heard you was out there playing my lines. And if I catch you for it, yo, ass is mine. If the boys in the hood are always hard. You come talking to trash, we'll pull your car. Knowing nothing in life but to be legit. Don't quote me, boy, because I ain't said shit. You know, those, I mean, the PSK and Parkside Killers and like, I mean, it was fucking Iraq, man, in West Philly in the 80s. Like, looked like Beirut. So, you, like you said, people say maybe first gangster rap, maybe first reality rap, because it was such a fun... You had Sugar Hill Records putting out these fun, you know, and Spoonie G and, and you know, Sugar Hill Gang and Kumo, Kumo D or Curtis Blow party music you know i think everyone would agree that's how it started right and then this sort of an extension comes, of disco basically sure yeah exactly and rhyming over the sheet yeah and then this guy comes out of philly talking about smoking dust and parkside kill i think people are like what the fuck tell me about this party on the south side come up with me jump to keep around ride got at the bar count some black count some cheaper sheep and the one in the wag Got to the place and who did I see? A sucker ass nigga trying to sound like me. Put my pistol up against his head. I said, the sucker ass nigga, I said, she did. I threw it around across. You know, and he's did, did you get it when it came out? I mean, nah, you were probably I, I don't think eight so. or I was, nine. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, 85 or 86. I was eight or nine. I got it on a visceral. I knew I felt it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, was it the drum, the simplicity of the drum programming? Was it his rhyme style? Was it his voice? I mean, I look back at stuff that influenced me and realized that it influenced me and I didn't even understand it the way I should have. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. if I look at Nation of Millions and how old I was, what did I really, I thought I got it and it changed, it, it helped me become who I am and the person I am. But I listen to that record now and understand as a man what Chuck was doing yeah. and standing up against or for, you know what I'm saying? And saying like, I mean, you know, it's political commentary, you know, social political commentary. Like, was I understanding that in 88? Like, you know, no, sure I didn't. Yeah. One other Philly thing that comes up throughout your catalog or, you know, sort of Philly icon in series events is, is Mumia. Uh -huh. You mention him repeatedly yes. on your records. It's for everybody holding hammers. If you come into our shows and you go bananas and holding banners in support of Mumia Jamal. Run up on you fucking pigs with the heaters and all. I'm deceiving the law. It's the cold sound from the city where they frame Mumia. We gonna break them out, run up with them flames and heaters. I'm ready to go to war for Mumia. Fuck George Bush and his war. We gonna see 
what does his case mean to you as a as a person as a journalist i mean they tr they tr they tried they didn't succeed but they tried to silence an intelligent black voice in philly you know he was well respected no criminal history no violent history loving family man you know but that was the most corrupt police department in the country maybe ever the, the 80s mm -hmm. frank rizzo police department yeah. i mean infamous you know what i mean like so he this man starts shedding light on that it starts picking up steam nationally and all of a sudden this case where nothing adds up puts him on death row and now he's very ill and on death row yeah it's a metaphor for the city of Philadelphia that he's still fighting. You know, it won't go out. Like, won't cop a plea. You know what I mean? Still writing brilliantly, I might add. Still, when he is allowed phone time, talking to whoever will allow, give him the voice and saying brilliant things, just like, that's our city. Do you remember the 85 move bombing? The incident discussed here was a culmination of a 1985 police operation in the city of Philadelphia that was the end of a standoff between police and a radical black liberation group called MOVE. MOVE members, led by John Africa, lived in a commune, and in 1981 they relocated to a row house in West Philadelphia. Over the following four years, neighbors complained about several aspects of MOVE's activities, including rat attracting composting and the broadcasting of political messages at all hours. Both Mayor W. Wilson Good and Police Commissioner Gregor Sambor began to categorize the group as a terrorist organization. On May 13, 1985, the police attempted to clear the building and arrest indicted MOVE members. This led to an armed standoff. Police lobbed tear gas in the building, MOVE members fired back, and consequently the police returned fire with automatic weapons. Sambor then ordered that the compound be bombed. From a state police helicopter, two one-pound bombs made of FBI-supplied water gel explosive were dropped on the house. The resulting explosions ignited a fire that eventually destroyed approximately 65 nearby houses. The firefighters, who had earlier deluged hosed the MOVE members in a failed attempt to evict them from the building, stood by as the fire caused by the bomb engulfed the first house and spread to others, having been given orders to let the fire burn. Officials claimed to fear that MOVE would shoot at the firefighters, as they had done before. Eleven people, John Africa, five other adults, and five children aged 7 to 13, died in the resulting fire, and more than 250 people were left homeless. Ramona Africa, one of the two survivors, stated that the police fired at those trying to escape the burning house, while police stated that MOVE members had been firing at the police. Mayor Good soon appointed an investigative commission which issued his report on March 6, 1986. The report denounced the actions of the city government, stating that dropping a bomb on an occupied row house was unconscionable. No one from the city government was charged criminally. I could see the smoke from my front porch. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, like it was yesterday. Crazy, crazy. I mean, did you see the documentary? Yeah, yeah. Heavy stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember like seeing the smoke and it's like, you're told things about your mayor and about the police when you're a kid. That's the good guy. So you're, I'm asking my mom and my dad, why did the nice man blow up the poor people. You know what I'm saying? I don't know like how my, I don't remember like what my mom or dad said. I'm sure they just lied because the truth, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you're eight, if you're ready for that. Well, yeah. sit down, son, and let me tell you what, <laughs> how institutionalized race, let, let daddy tell you about institutionalized racism <laughs> and how it's going to affect your life and what you're going to see the next 30 years. I don't, yeah. I don't think that's, you know, <laughs> My pop was just kind of like OG Italian guy, and not not ready to tackle that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's obviously an insane event. You know, moving kind of to your career, even getting to your something as simple as your name, right? You're originally Icon. Sure. Uh, maybe uh, you had other rap names before that. Tons. I don't know. Yeah, they were usually whatever graph name I was writing. Mm -hmm. I guess it's been enough years where I won't get locked up. <laughs> what what are some yeah, what are Yeah, some I wrote Crash 77 for a long time and I wrote Icon with a K. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, a lot of MCs, you know, starting obviously with KRS. Yeah. You know, KRS was Krishna. 
and turned it into KRS for Krishna. Uh, has KRS started the like, y'all, you know, uh, Levi 167, you know, a lot of like do your graph legends would just use that. Oh, that's my graph name. It could be my, my rap. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing then. You know what I mean? Were you any good at, uh, at writing? Th at throw ups. Yeah. Could, could I do an amazing piece or something? No. Uh, no, but we were just, for me, it was like, I ran with all amazing graph writers. I grew up with Nope. He's one of the a Philly legend. Like, so running around and just doing throw ups while those dudes, it, it was more, it's like, are you guys familiar with Love Park in Philly? Yeah. Like, you know, they, you can't skate there, but it's in the 80s and 90s where everyone skated, smoked blunts. It's like our Washington Square Park, basically. Mm -hmm. Skateboarders, hip hop heads, you know. 40s blunts, a boombox playing hip hop. It's kind of everyone was writing, rapping, skateboarding, smoking blunt. It's like everyone did everything. And then as you got a little bit older, oh, well, Stevie's really dope at skateboarding. And now Stevie Williams is the biggest skateboarder in the world. Oh, Vinny's a little bit better at rapping. So now Vinny does that. You know what I mean? Everyone sort of, everyone was finding themselves there. You know what I mean? So it was graph writers and and I just, I always ran around with graph writers, even though I was probably the least good of them. So the name Vinny Paz itself, right. right? You sort of break it in a little bit on the on the second album. Yeah, and yeah. some of the cuts toward the end of the record. I don't sure. know if they were recorded sure. later than the others or not, but you, you break it in as kind of a nickname sure. amongst many. Sure. And then the next record, it's sort of your full-fledged name. Sure. How, how did that happen? Um, well, I always loved like how EPMD were Eric and Parrish. I, lo I thought it was dope that Keith Murray's rap name was Keith Murray. <laughs> I'm like, that's just, it was just dope. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, be dope to incorporate my name. My real last name's too long and, you know, you never want to... Um, the old Italian adage of like, uh, they won't like you if you're too ethnic. You know what I mean? Hence why everyone everyone chopped their name at Ellis Island. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, Pazienza. American boxer, Vinny Pazienza, who boxed under the nickname, the Pasmanian Devil. Me and my pop, uh, like every Saturday that he fought on Wide World Sports on ABC, we would watch it. He was like a hero. So I'm like, that's it. I can use my real name and pay. And, yeah. You know, it's an homage to my favorite fighter. So, yeah, that, that's how it, it, it came up. How I, I, well, like you said, it, it, I think you, you, you made a good point that I like slid it in a little bit on Violent by Design. You know what I mean? It's like uh, when you give your girlfriend good news before you tell her that you, you broke her car or something. <laughs> You know, I've said, well, yeah. You, yeah. You, you know, you did. Did you know at that even back at like 2000 that it was going to be your? Major I think I was name? like, this has a quote unquote ring to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's corny to say, but it, it is needed to some degree. You know what I mean? It's not that I ever thought I'd be a pop star, but it's like you, st like I said about being a bit too, um, oh, like abrasive. It's like even those names, like Icon, the Verbal Hologram. Right. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of syllables. Fucking long. <laughs> it's like it's kind of fucking stupid, maybe. And then it's like, all right, I'll chop off the verbal. That's dumb. And it's like, oh, I said Icon, a hologram a couple of times, and it's like, all right, the word Icon. Let's think about that word. There's got to be fucking ten dudes around the world that th thought of that same name. And then there were, and there were. There's out. like a DJ Icon. There's, like, there are dudes, various, right? It could be graph writers, DJs, B boys. It's like, okay. This is me. This is who I am. And it represents me more than any of these other names, whether they were my graph name or anything else. You know what I mean? So yeah. like you said, I, I, I don't know how deliberate it was, but it must have been subconscious to be like, say it a couple of times on this record so it's not foreign yeah. next time out. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So uh, boxing, was there ever a point even when you were a kid that you were like, yes. oh, it's boxing or music? Yes. What was the fork in the road moment? I believe that you cannot do anything in life that you love, that you want to succeed in and not do it 110%. And it was like, all right, am I going to run five miles before school, go to school, 
go to the gym and spar, do this rap shit, like something's gonna have to give, you know what I mean? Like, I think being paid to have a couple drinks, kick it with your boys and rap on stage might be better than getting concussed. Maybe. Right. (laughs) Yeah. How old were you when you figured that out? Like early high school. Uh, Had my pop not passed, it probably would have flip-flopped. You know what I mean? Because... He was that heavy into boxing. Yeah. And that like... His brother was a trainer, right? Oh, gee. Well, my Uncle Willie trained Jeff Chandler, who was Bantamweight champ. So I was around there. He was married to my Aunt Becky. They called her K.O. Becky. He like... The Phil, they call there's a defensive style called the Philly shell, and he like basically invented it, Uncle Willie, like wow. this style that's still used and like train, you know. Yeah. But you might have ended up as a boxer. I, I believe. Gone. Well, I know my dad would have shut the music shit down. Had had I said I want to go further than I, uh, uh, Javi. Sorry, yeah. I said have it. <laughs> Freudian slip. Right, right. right. Uh, my brother Lou was a metal musician. They let them practice at the house. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if my pop was like, it, like if my brother was like, this is what I want to do for a living. I, I don't know what my pop would have said. He didn't really get the chance because, you know what I mean? He, he passed away. Like my gut tells me just the stubborn OG Dago shit would have been like, hey, it's a fucking pipe dream. Yeah, you got to get your hands dirty. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that, like, you know, fighting or, or um, my pop, pop ran a like a, a car detail, you know, my pop owned a car detail shop. Yeah. And uh, some guy cut across the lot when I was like on the lot to avoid a, a light, but he was doing like 60 and I was out there. I was a little kid. My pop like chased him up to the light and just drubbed the shit out of him through the window. Wow. Yeah. He wasn't fucking around. You know, I was looking at shit about the group, right? Okay. And the, the early days in the interviews you did. And you said, like, something oh, that no. I thought was kind of surprising. No, it's not bad. It's not bad. Just like, as far, <laughs> you as, don't like, know that yet. Yeah, as, far as breaking out on the West Coast, yes. that Peanut Butter Wolf was yes. super important to that. Very how, important. How was that? He was working at T- THC, yeah? I could be saying this wrong. I know T and C are correct. Maybe not the middle one. <laughs> THC was a little distributor. And... You know, we were Philly kids It's without a name. And uh, he was working there and was like, we'll take a box and like basically set in motion what to this day, 19 years later, is still a fucking humongous fan base on the West Coast. And it's because of that guy. And he's a good dude, Chris. That's so interesting. People wouldn't, I think, knowing him and knowing his reputation and some of the stuff he's been involved with, people might not necessarily think, oh, like Jedi Mind Trick. I agree. That's a group he would get behind. I agree. Maybe he didn't like the music. Maybe he doesn't now. But maybe he saw, I think he loves music so much and was like, well, maybe this isn't my thing, but it's going to be somebody's. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, because... I know myself, like, would I have to love Taylor Swift's stuff to put her out and make $20 million? I would just have to know that it was good to somebody, you know what I mean? Or would mean something to somebody. Yeah. Uh, My apologies to anyone who could actually be affected by Taylor Swift's music. (laughs) That's another topic for another day. There there was one other kind of, like, quirky little thing about a lot of your songs. Almost every time, I think... From the beginning through today, you use overstand instead of understand. I left the scar, so your crabs would overstand. Mental will take you with you to a holy land. You can't overstand the mathematics. How I rip bars, walk through walls, perform magic. Y'all pretended to overstand the matrix without attempting to overstand its basics. We dedicated to cannabis. Y'all don't overstand how fucking strong my wife is. I'm from a time where every song was righteous. Before rap was just a swarm of white kids. Yeah. Why why is that? I know that's it's a formulation that was popular for a while and then sort of fell out of favor. Like it's why been, well well the thing is when we were all early we we're talking about Islam, but being around people you know, obviously it's anything with Judaism, Christianity, there's there's sex. You know what I mean? You have a Sunni Islam, you know, 
you had Shia, and then you had all these offshoots, you know, from when Malcolm X, you know, the, the nation of five percent the five percent nation of gods and earths and the nation of Islam. And um the slang originated from the five percenters basically saying, if you're understanding something, you're standing under it, you're below it, you're not grasping it. If you overstand, you're standing over the knowledge with the power over the knowledge and using it. So it was just it's tons of five percenters in Philly, and I kicked it with them, you know, I love Park. So it's just like, you just pick up little slang, like they call each other God. Yo, peace, God. You've heard that, you know. Yeah, in of New Yorker, of course. course. Yeah, like, peace, God, peace, God. Like, you know, it starts becoming, it does, it does mean something, but then it just starts, it's, the vernacular just becomes a part of the lexicon, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Where it's, it goes beyond that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it's just, uh, I've always been a sponge, man, like of, of of my surroundings, you know what I mean? Down to like the fact that I'll rock a, a European festival with 30,000 people wearing an obituary sweatshirt, you know what I mean? Because I'm not like, pl- like to play a part, like you have to dress like a rapper and it's a uniform. Why don't you look that, you know what I mean? Like I'm not, like there's no box, you know what I mean? If someone doesn't get... Did I drop John Tardy's name, who's the singer of Obituary? Like, I can't worry about that. Right. You know what I mean? Because if I don't say that line, then I'm not being me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, another thing that comes through your music a lot. I shouldn't have said that bad thing about Taylor Swift. She seems like a nice girl. <laughs> she actually does. Sure. Of all pop stars, she does seem like a nice girl. Yeah. yeah. It's, I don't like her music, but I actually think she's probably a good human being. So, sorry, Taylor. <laughs> I'm sure you're listening. Right. Sure, she's a fan of Johnny Lydon as well. Um, Whoever's listening to this podcast of me, please go back and listen to the John Lydon episode. Oh, thank you. So you either mention or quote, sometimes like literally quote or paraphrase Nietzsche a ton. Yeah, yeah. From from the beginning. As I decay, demons prey above me like a vulture. Ability to endure contradiction is a high sign of culture. Verbal sculpture, self-defacing. It is not God or lunacy that I am facing. Sending you to the square circle to meet me. To beat me won't be easy. You'll face DC's of Nietzsche. Blood will appease me. Rap the mic is part of me. Nietzsche in philosophy. I am a vampire. I'm proud to be. I cannot be seen in your photography. What what is it about him that resonates with you? I don't I don't know I I, I I'm never able to say to answer that when anyone says like why do you like da 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 why do you why why are you obsessed with Kubrick why are you is it uh do you see yourself in people maybe and that's what it is I don't know you know what I mean like if I was to ask you that like you know who is your favorite writer do you know offhand or would you have to think about it? I. Probably, uh, I would say maybe uh, Sarah Kane, who's an English playwright. Okay, now would, now would it be because, oh, it's so articulate, or I like the style, or do you connect with it? Do you think that's what it is? It's hard being on this end of the... <laughs> but I, I, I feel like, yeah. I feel like I don't know how, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, but something, what do you, what's something the, about not, him always... Not kinship, kindred spirit, that, that's... The, I think like with Bukowski, it's 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 sad to say that I see a lot of you know when you're talking about a mess of a man. But I think when I see anything of myself, I'm not comparing my brilliance. I, I'm not brilliant like these guys, but some of their faults. When I think like I've never liked anyone artistically that I saw as perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Tom Hanks. I don't know how many Oscars he has. Tom Hanks has been being Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks plays Tom Hanks. I don't know how he wins awards for that. Tom Hanks has never not been Tom Hanks since Bosom Buddies. <laughs> I don't understand it. And I'm like, see, I must see the world differently. Not better, just differently. Yeah. That I don't see, like, but maybe it's because that guy just seems like this perfectly nice white American male living, the, and I don't have any connection to that. Yeah. And I see someone, Dostoevsky, this fucking tormented, rundown man. And I'm like, oh, I see that. Right. I know what that's about. And with Nietzsche, it's not like you're not just name dropping like, oh, you know, Superman or something like not just like the most obvious concepts. (laughs) Like you quote is like late shit. Yeah. Well, I, I, the more that he lost his mind, I think I started getting more (laughs) 
You know what I mean? I'm right, intrigued the by it. I, mean, I know it's dark. I, like, and, I, and we're obviously having a great time talking. So it's not like, I don't want to say like I'm a dark person. I am when I'm alone and my thoughts are dark. Yeah. But I don't like to project that. You know what I mean? Because it's like, fuck it, man. We're all, we all have our limbs. We're all breathing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kids is healthy. That's so, it's, it's like, you know, but I always, I always seem to like be drawn to darkness. Film, writers, you know what I mean? Someone, there's something like that, ah, oh man, a happy motherfucker makes me mad. Like, I hate happy people, bro. I hate, but I think I don't. I think I hate that I'm not that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, before before I say I hate happy people, I should, I should go back and say, I think that I do because I'm just mad that I can't attain that. Right. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think I hate stupid people because stupid people are happy because they're too stupid to know that they shouldn't be. That everything is fucked, that we're all going to be worm food sooner than later. All three of us probably are more than we're closer to being dead than being born. It's, yeah. it's dark shit. It's just, yeah, this is mathematically. Yeah, you're great. Yeah. And then you do, you can't argue with math, man. Yeah. You can argue whether or not there's an afterlife or do I turn into energy. You can argue all of that, and everyone could have a valid point from a brilliant scientist that's an atheist. To an Islamic scholar, but you can't argue with that. Yeah, and that we're gonna kick the fucking bucket. Yeah, well, you you said yourself, you said, you know, I'm the center inside the placenta of math. You get split in fucking half, but I call the hologram wrath. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solid liquids and gas. Yeah, yeah, What the hell did that mean, anyway? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, when I was playing with words there, or in other parts, like, oh, that's dope. And then, well, does it make sense? I go, well, I don't know. What does that mean? When, when does it become like? Pseudo intellectual, you know, this goes to any writing, you know, rock or whatever. It's like, is there's a thin line between saying some clever shit and like, I took too much acid, drivel, right. pseudo intellectual bullshit to a dude you want to throw an egg at, you know, at a at a festival. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I look back on that. And probably. So you may have this, tipped over that line sure, once or twice. Yeah, this is dope line. This sounds dope rhythmically. Mechanically, you know what I mean? Yeah. Something like that, maybe. Mm. Interesting. Um, you know, one other thing I know we're kind of running a little low on time is like... It's all good, brother. Yeah. Good time. But, you know, Violent by Design, you know, people love it. I think yeah. it's kind of, you know, a maybe your sort of fan's favorite sure. of your records. And at least from what I've read, you seem much more attached to the Servants in Heaven yeah, I, uh... record. Yeah, how, what is that like that people are like, yeah, I really love that thing you did when you were 19, like over and over again, sort of your whole um, life? It's, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about of think of yourself when you were 19, if you were interviewed John Lydon then, and how lucky you are to have done it now that you've yeah. seen shit and taken more in, you know what I mean? Whereas you didn't then. It's, it's, it's kind of me being like, Thank you for complimenting the 19-year-old idiot. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's weird because they're, they're showing you love. You know what I mean? But it's like I find I'm the type of person that will hit the lottery and the first thing I'll be bitching about is the taxes instead of, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Like It's like constant, man. It's like I'm the rap Larry David. It's like I fucking find the bad in everything. Yeah. Even, even if I'm doing it jokingly. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'll do it with a smile on my face and try not to make anyone else. So it's like, I'm like, what, this is just, what does that mean? I'm whack now? That record's from 2000. So, you know what I'm saying? Have I like, not done anything good? That, right, right. Like, now, yeah. Is that what they're implying? No, of course not. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, what if my favorite Slayer record is Rain of Blood? And that's 86. So I'm telling them you haven't done anything great in 29 years? No, it's just, you know what I mean? Or like, is is I think London Calling, wouldn't you say it's the best Clash album? But like, does that mean Joe didn't do other shit? Or maybe other shit is better? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. 
I don't know, you know, and it's like that's probably with everybody. I, I, I'm, I'm happy that one person ever took the time to pull out ten bucks out of their pocket and buy my music. So any form of, you know, any effect it, it may have had on anyone, I should just it's a blessing. Yeah. And the, you know, something, you know, going through your, your solo records, especially the, the first one, there's the keep moving on track. Yeah. I think the middle verse is, you know, literally about you. Yeah. The first and third verses of it are like this sort of storytelling sure, sure. first person thing. Yeah. Signed up because they promised me some college money. I ain't the smartest motherfucker, but I'm not a dummy. They told me I would be stationed in places hot and sunny. I had a lot of pride, motherfuckers got it from me. These people over here innocent, they never harm me. My sergeant tried to convince me. Yeah, you don't really do that very much. Nah. What uh what made you try it on that record? Um you brought it up earlier, like when did something click in your head to talk about yourself you know what I mean yeah. I, I think it was like can I am I comfortable enough in my own skin to um like I did a song about the depersonalization right, right. call this happiness just the word there's not an accurate diagnosis to show you basic neurobiology isn't close to I'm watching life as a spectator I can't help myself even though I possess data it's not a part of my spirit to want to test nature you think you know what I'm feeling cousin and less wager I have I talked to Jan about it, and this is a struggle, and I'm going to cry while I write this song. I might cry in the, in the booth. When I did a song for my stepfather, it took me, like, a while to get through that verse in the mic. I walked in that morning and knew something was wrong. I tried to talk to you, rock, you didn't respond. I called 911 and then ran for my mom's. Waited for the ambulance and I tried to be calm. Moms went with you, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay... When these bozos behind a computer in North Dakota call you whack, you have the choice to shrug it off and go, what? who fucking cares, man? This kid didn't grow up like me. You know what I'm saying? Who Who is he to critique me? But when you put yourself out there like that, it becomes more personal if they were to critique that. So I think that's what the delay was. All those years, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if someone would like, like, it would really hurt. It would they... hurt. It would hurt and make me angry. Not, not just like, oh, that hurt my feelings. Like, I'd want to track them down and Jay and Silent Bob me. Yeah. Do you post as Magnolia fan on MoviePoopShoot.com? Yeah. Did you write? Fuck Jay and Silent Bob. Fuck them and their stupid asses. Yeah, a while ago. So? Like, find their house and pummel them. Right. Because now you're shitting on me and a disease and a disorder. And you're, you're mocking mental illness. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, like, I don't play that on any level. Forget me. Like, I don't... You know, the fact that there are mentally ill veterans... That we don't take care of on the street. No, this it's a plague in this country. You know what I'm saying? People in jail, the crime rate. They're not treating people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That that you don't you don't fix people by putting them in a cage. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You don't. When someone gets sick, physically sick, you don't lock them in a room. Right. You, you don't treat, say make yourself better. No, you treat yeah. them. Yeah. You know what I mean? With care and love. And if need be medicine, you don't lock them away into a room. You know what I'm saying? And that's what they're doing to these people that have mental problems and they're treating them like criminals. You know what I mean? So it's like, I guess that's with Key Moving On or the song for my step pop. Or I think I just started being like, well, I don't want to go. I don't want to finish my career and not say this stuff. So... I guess I'll say it and I'll deal with it. Yeah. 
you know? I mean, you, you brought up, is happiness just a word? Yeah. Literally the opening lines of that song are about how your family is not gonna, you know, doesn't understand what you're going through. Yes, my family don't understand what I go through. Underdiagnosed for 20 years, they never broke through. You ever been in such a fog, you don't know you? Never been able to do the shit you supposed to? Did that song actually get through to them? No. No. Interesting. No. Not one bit. We're uh, East Coast Italians denial. That's East Coast. That's Italians everywhere. Deny, deny, deny. Nothing's wrong. You know what I'm saying? There is no mental. I can hear my father's voice. Shake it off. You know what I mean? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. People that came up in depression, people in Agrigento, Sicily, who lived in dirt houses, like don't want to hear about that kind of shit. It's a generational gap. You know what I mean? So even My, though you literally laid out very specifically very like, specific symptoms and so everything. forth. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. My mom knows that it exists and it's like the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Is she the best mom of all time? Yes. Is she my best friend? Yes. Do we hang out all the time? Yes. But it's like, it's, I think it's, it comes back to like, maybe she'll feel responsible. You know what I'm saying? And then that opens up a whole other can of worms. It's like, so it's, oh, we just don't talk about things. You know what I mean? The whole family. I'm not just putting on my nuclear family. Right. Our extended family. It's like anything crazy that's ever happened. It's not like, let's sit down and discuss this. It's like. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I said, elephant in the room. Yeah. It'll always be like that. You know, you've talked about actually on that same record, you had ancient change where you talk about you still have the same friends you did. Yeah. You know, in your in your teens and early twenties. No, I'm 20s. with I still got the same people that remain with me. That was drinking forties with me when they slain Biggie, and the same motherfuckers felt the pain with me when my stepfather died and they came with me. I ain't expect nothing less from them. And you're with one of them now, your manager. Like what? What are, are there downsides to that? I think that, again, I'm not gonna- I don't mean to ask one with one in no, the room, No, 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 but, I'm not gonna know. get into God or anything like that. I'm just gonna get into, um, in, um, in fate. I believe, I have people around me that are filmmakers. I have people around me that are pro skaters. I have, my friend Jim, who was a pro skater, is now a successful artist. He's currently in Amsterdam showing his art. There is no way that I just happened to bump into these people that were like-minded to me. It's just, there's no way that I believe that. And that, you know when you have a friend and they just get it? They just get it. A little unspoken shit. You don't have to, like, some of these guys, I can just be like, you know what I mean? And he'll know what that means. <laughs> Because it's like, you're so much alike in so many ways. You know what I mean? And intellectually, we couldn't be further from each other. A lot of us, in, you know, and how, like how we conduct ourselves on the daily. You know what I mean? Like I sleep all day. He's, he's working all day on, you know what I mean? The, the business end of the music. It's like, yeah. but like everyone that I consider like a, a, in our brotherhood is like-minded intellectually. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ideal, ideologically, we feel, you know, obviously everyone doesn't agree on everything, you know, not every band or every, but yeah. we basically see the world alike. It's, and I just don't believe that I stumbled upon six, seven or eight dudes 25 years ago that that just happened. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. if, it, if it did happen that way, then I guess, then it's, it's the, uh, the big bang theory. You know what I mean? And it just. Yeah, you know. One final thing, sure. uh, if you don't mind. We haven't really talked about uh, you and Stu much, your partnership you yeah. know, in Jedi Mind Tricks. Yeah, it's my man. But there was one thing that happened with you two that I think like maybe is emblematic of your relationship. I was hoping maybe you could take me back to it, which uh -huh. is like, you guys are 16, Rough House, you're a group already. Yeah. Rough House Records approaches you, yeah. approaches the two of you. And then tells Stoop, hey, I want you to sign a production deal. Forget this other guy rapping. Yes. And he said, no, that's an insane amount of loyalty for a teenager who's basically been offered his lifelong dream yes. on a silver platter to have. How, how did you guys manage to stay so loyal to each other before you had any real success? 
if someone like put a gun to my head and said, describe that kid in one word, it would be loyal. It's, I, I, I can honestly say I've never seen that trait so dominant in another person in my life. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. So the least I can do is reciprocate, you know? That's wild. I, I, yeah. I mean, like the thing was, I was, he's older than me. I was 15. He was like 18 and I couldn't have even have signed the contract legally without my mom. You know what I mean? So there was doubts that even if, you know, that I couldn't could either way home. and they were signing the Fugees and they had Cypress and Criss Cross and like Nas was originally going to be with Ralph House, but Columbia bought it out. So like, who knows if he would have contributed to any of those records? Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. If it was probably a shitty deal. But a deal that 99 of 100 people take, him being the one that didn't, you know? I'm I'm glad he didn't. Yeah. And that seems like a a great place to end. Congratulations on the new record. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Of course. You guys are a class act.